One of these two captures is a real Pentium system with a Voodoo 2. The other is a nearly full software emulation of the exact same thing. This emulation is so good, I've been using it in videos for over two years now, and I bet you didn't even notice. Here's several videos of mine. Half of these used emulation in the video instead of video capture. If you've seen them before, try to pause and guess which is which. I've been taking full advantage of this software's capability to emulate systems from the 8088 to the Pentium 2. The answer, these were done with pure emulation capture. And actually, this one was proven preliminarily possible using emulation. And this isn't even counting the videos where I just straight up mentioned I used emulation. Today, I want to talk about just how phenomenally good and helpful these emulators are. And note, I'm not saying virtual machines. These are much more than that. First though, I should tell you what software it is I'm talking about exactly, but that's not a very straightforward thing. And I've done my best to research this so I can give you the high level view. PCEM is the genesis of the current best emulators of PC hardware. It was made by Sarah Walker and is a combination of fully custom code and leveraging components made for other emulators. The development process for this was tightly controlled, and some developers who had contributed code ended up forking PCEM as PCEM X while working on some larger features. That fork became 86 box, which is maintained by Batler. Development split focus between the two, and they're now quite different. PCEM's development lead has also changed, and there haven't been any new releases of it in years, but there does seem to be some development going on still. There are also some forks of 86 box trying to get new features added, but there aren't any release builds of that yet. Overall, right now, 86 box seems to have the best combination of features, usability, and stability. Just keep in mind that it owes a lot to PCEM, and the core of this can be attributed to that. I'd also like to mention that these programs aren't meant to walk you through the process. They are phenomenally complex, and focusing on the primary functionality is still the main goal. So some familiarity with the technology of this era is needed. All right, with that out of the way, what makes 86 box so special? I mentioned it's not a virtual machine. That is because it is not a high level emulator. This means it does not translate the internal operations to the host to execute itself. Instead, it directly emulates entire processors and runs the code on that. This is how some more advanced game console emulators work and are often referred to as cycle accurate. The advantage of this for consoles is better emulation of edge case games. On PC, that's frankly never going to be the goal. That's because what you get with cycle accurate PC emulation is the ability to emulate hardware peripherals, real hardware peripherals. The comparison I showed initially is my tiny Pentium system. In that, we can emulate the 233 megahertz Pentium MMX, 3DFX Voodoo 2, S3 Verge DX, the exact motherboard chipset, the RTL 8029 network interface, and it even boots off of the disk image from the real machine. The only part not emulated in this computer is the Allreal Vortex 2, but if I'd had my way initially, the system would have had an AW64 Gold, which can be emulated. This is just one of my physical computers I've been able to emulate directly, and this is where this software's true potential is. I found it invaluable in testing for different programs and even for debugging some hardware before going over to the real thing. Now, frankly, what you can do with this is so open-ended that it's daunting to even talk about. So let's just start with the basic setup of a system. We'll aim to run Windows 98 on average hardware. To use 86 box, you need two parts the program itself, and the ROMs. The program is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and the ROMs are the firmware for the different peripherals and motherboards. There are setup instructions for going over how to get these and set up the files for each platform that you should take a look at. The simple version is just to put the ROM folder next to the program, though. Once you have everything in place, you can launch the software, and by default, it will boot into IBM BASIC emulating an 8088. From here, you need to configure the computer how you want in the settings. 86 box always directly boots the current hardware config, which is stored in a text file. As of the time of making this video, there is no manager included to have multiple machines. There are some third-party managers available to do this for you, and an integrated one is being developed. Personally, I just prefer to have separate folders for the machines with everything needed in there. So I just copy the main files when I need another one. The files are like 
100 megabytes total. So one ISO is probably going to be more than that. Now, don't worry about the config file because there's a nice GUI to set up the machine, but this is where you need to know what you're doing. The first option is the machine type, which is really asking what kind of processor support you are targeting. Without knowing what these mean, this could be fairly confusing. Personally, I would like to see some other metric added here, like the year these came out, as a foothold newcomers could... Before I even finish writing this sentence in my script, I realized I could just make that happen. So I actually modified the software and submitted a pull request that was accepted. So in the future, you should see years next to the machine type to have a quick idea of when they're from. I'll talk more about the machine type later. For right now, let's just pick socket seven dual voltage. And I'm going to set the machine to the FIC VA502 for particular demonstration purposes. And I'm gonna leave the CPU as default. We should bump up the RAM though. It defaults to the minimum, but for this, we can set it to 128 safely. Next, we need to set up your display options. And this is a lot of options. I spoke with the contributors and they're contemplating how to break this up to be more approachable too. For now, unless you know exactly what to emulate, I'm gonna give you some rough guidelines. For early DOS systems, the ISA Trident VGA cards are a good option to know you can display almost anything. For later DOS and basic Windows 98 systems, a PCI S3 Trio 64 is a very solid option for 2D and will work well if you want to add a Voodoo card later. And if you're just trying to max it out, go for the Voodoo 3 3000. I'll come back to the idea of a max spec system later, but generally that shouldn't be your goal. Next up, input devices. Go ahead and pick a standard PS2 mouse for that. Your keyboard is passed through automatically when you click on the windows, which you can escape with middle mouse or control end. On to sound, the Sound Blaster 16 is extremely well supported out of the box by Windows 98 and is a good way to quickly get going. Now we can skip right on down to the hard drives. We're gonna create a new image. Pick where you want to save the file. I usually make a folder for hard drives next to the program. For the file type, I would recommend a dynamic VHD if you're just going to use this for virtual stuff. Since I like to emulate specific machines I physically own, I typically use raw images because you can easily read and write those from real drives. For the size of the image, keep in mind the limits of your OS. Roughly, Windows 98 should be limited to 128 gigabytes. Later DOSs max out at eight gigabytes split over four two gigabyte partitions, and early DOSs are limited to 32 megabytes. 10 gigabytes is a lot for Windows 98 though, so we'll just go with that for now and we can leave everything else here as is. Let's look at the floppy and CD-ROM drives for a moment. Leave the floppies as is for now and set the CD-ROM bus type to a tappy to enable it. And that's it. Hit OK and save the changes. It will reboot the machine with the new specs. This motherboard and BIOS are a good starting point for demonstration purposes because you're going to begin to realize the scope of this emulator. Sure, we just chose all our hardware, but now we have to actually configure it. On post, it will show an error stating floppy disk fail. Now, you can hit F1 to ignore that and continue, but it will do this every time and your floppies won't work right. If we go into the setup and check the standard CMOS setup, we can see floppy drive A is expected to be a 1.44 megabyte drive and B isn't set at all. This is the nature of being actual hardware emulation. You have to deal with actual hardware quirks. That Sound Blaster 16 we added? You can change the address, IRQ, and DMA. The defaults are fine, but that's the level of detail this goes into. To fix this floppy problem, we're gonna have to do two things. Leave drive A alone in the BIOS and set B to a 360K drive. Next, I want to change the machine config to use a 144 drive for drive A instead, but not yet. When you save the machine config, it will always have to restart the emulator. So first, we need to quit and save the BIOS config before we change the hardware settings. After that though, it will get through the post process and be ready to boot. So from here, we need to install Windows 98. WinWorld has that available for download. And fun fact, Microsoft sent WinWorld a DMCA request to remove XP only. So you can construe this as a not unauthorized source. So go ahead and grab the bootable second edition image. With that downloaded, you can mount it from the media menu, reboot, and it does not boot. Welcome to old computers. This is what the experience is really like. Now, this is a decent puzzle for beginners if you want to challenge her. So if you're following along, you can pause the video to try and solve this yourself. The manuals available on the internet to help troubleshoot even. And there are at least two solutions without making any changes to 86 boxes config. The cause of this problem? 
The BIOS is not trying to boot from a CD. You need to go back into the BIOS by hitting delete during post, go into the feature setup, and then change the boot sequence to prioritize CD booting. Alternatively, you could grab the startup boot floppy from Winworld and use that to boot, which then loads the CD-ROM drivers and hands it off to the CD for the install. This was a fairly common problem to have with hardware of this era. After that, it's a very standard Windows 98 install process, but a quick note if you're watching this video close to when I release it before 86 box 4.2 is the stable version. Switch to the ASUS PIP55T2P4 machine type because there's a bug with the FIC VA502 board that actually I discovered while this was being filmed and it was fixed. Once 4.2 is out or you compile it from source, this will be fixed. Now we're gonna skip past most of the install process. It's no different from normal and due to emulating older hardware, it takes a while. I'll point out though that after the install with these hardware choices, Windows 98 will be able to install the drivers automatically and we'll have sound and better quality video options on the very first boot. Now, if you're creating a serious VM you wanna keep around for a while, here's a quick tip. It asks for the Windows 98 CD during the first boot to pull drivers off of it and it will do this again. You can put everything on the computer at once by copying the Win98 folder to C and changing the source path registry value to point to that instead. Now, it will always look on the hard drive and find all of the files it needs. The pro move is to format your hard drive in DOS and FDisk and then copy the Win98 folder to the HDD and install it directly from the hard drive instead of the CD. But using the registry is good if you're lazy or forget. Now at this point, we have a fully functional Windows 98 environment running inside a PC emulator. This is the basic process for getting machines set up with 86box. You can do the same thing for DOS, emulating something like a Socket 3 system and chucking in a 46DX4 and installing MS-DOS 6.2. You can go back further and get an IBM 5150 booting off of DOS 3.2 disks. And you could add an AST 6-pack plus to that for more RAM. Then you could try out my free DOS 8088 floppies. That was one of the videos I did using this software because being able to test against an accurate emulator made it a lot easier to determine what files were needed to make that OS work and transitioned perfectly to the real hardware when I tried it. But just emulating software is easy compared to what 86box can do. Hardware is where this really becomes impressive. Let's take my recent video about the mouse system's PC mouse. My box wasn't sealed, and in that video, I mentioned I'd already imaged the disks. What I didn't mention is I'd also already tested the setup process too, using 86box. One of the mouse options is emulating a mouse system's PC mouse. This is the normal serial version, but it's compatible with the exact same drivers I got with my physical one. This let me test software support with the mouse before ever plugging it in. For me, this made this one of the easiest and best planned simple videos like that I'd ever made. Here's another one. In the Web Vengeance video, I wanted to get networking functional on my tiny Pentium, which I had struggled with. Even after getting the drivers installed, the RTL 8029 network interface still wasn't working, but I couldn't be totally sure what the cause was. Thankfully, the RTL 8029 is one of the network cards 86 box can emulate. After imaging the boot drive and setting up the machine, I found my software was actually fine. I had a hardware issue with the tiny Pentium. With that, I found a workaround using a USB NIC and I recently swapped the motherboard out for the second unit and that solved the issue entirely. But 86 box was a very helpful troubleshooting step. Now, these aren't even fun examples like trying out different sound cards. The ability to just emulate ideal hardware that will never age and fail is a powerful tool but that's enough of the serious use cases. Let's get to the fun stuff now. Going back to the Windows 98 system we set up, we can make this a quite nice early 3D game machine. The main thing that will do that is adding a Voodoo card. This is a full emulation of the GPU of a 3DFX video card. There are several different versions of it even. And this isn't even the only 3D capable GPU in 86 box either. The Matrox Mystique and S3 Verge can do 3D as well. Even on real hardware, there was a reason that Voodoo cards were so popular, because they worked very well, and they were the best supported for the time period that this software focuses on. But you could totally try out those other cards if you wanted to as well. Do keep your hardware configuration in mind if you explore the video cards. You can end up in the same weird situation that the Tiny Pentium is in, where you have two 3D cards, which can lead to some confusing issues with games performing poorly, and trying to get them to use the right card in DirectX. 
That's why I picked the Trio 64 as a good 2D card that won't cause any 3D issues later. Anyway, for our system, I'm going to add a Voodoo 2 to it. This is done as an additional video card because that is a 3D GPU only. Now just adding the card is only the first step. After you reboot, Windows will ask you for drivers, just like it would on real hardware. There are kind of a lot of options for Voodoo 2 drivers out there, and covering all those is beyond the scope here, so I'm just going to use some normal official drivers for now. But I will show you a cool trick 86box has. How do you get the files into the emulated machine? There are lots of hard ways, like networking or writing it to a floppy and then imaging that, but 86box will let you mount a directory as a CD-ROM within the machine, and then you can copy files into it through that. This is hands down one of my favorite quality of life features. It's so slick. After you get the driver set up, you might want to get DirectX 9C installed as well. From here, you're all ready to try out some games. I'm going to install Revolt from a disk image I made myself as a bin cube. The important thing about that is that it preserves the CD audio track, so the music can still work in the emulator. Gameplay performance is generally very accurate. That is to say, the way you configure the machine will have a large impact on it. Sometimes games will run amazingly. Sometimes they might struggle. Comparing to the tiny Pentium as a point of reference, it feels right. You can absolutely find the points where the emulated hardware isn't up to the task of running something, just like the real hardware would. But 86box has, in a way, met its performance targets. The project has drawn a line in the sand, Pentium 2 and Celeron emulation, and will not pursue any faster processors. You can't multi-thread the emulation of a single linear thread like these old processors are. You just need more raw single core compute power, which is increasing much less each generation now. Now, I would give a completely different reason though. 86box already covers the last era of hardware that's highly unique. Beyond this point, most new features for gaming, as one example, were added through software APIs rather than direct hardware functionality. Higher level virtualization or translation like Wine can provide much better performing results in those kind of programs without really sacrificing any accuracy. So to me, it makes sense to stop around Pentium 2 and focus on improving that and everything before it instead. There is still plenty of interesting hardware in the two decades that 86box emulates that could be added. There is still so much more I could talk about with this software. MT32 MIDI emulation, passing through serial to real hardware, outputting to virtual printers. There's an unending amount to explore here, which is the real strength of this software, the ability to take risks and explore. With physical hardware, it takes a lot of time, expense, and space to experience these things, and they fail on you, like the network card and the tiny Pentium. 86 box can be an amazing and risk-free way to explore these kinds of systems. I will be continuing to use it myself for researching videos and testing things, and I can only highly recommend it to everyone else to check out. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and we're past my scripted portion, so let's see. Uh, yep, that one's facing a wall. Oh, that one's still good. I am also just getting absolutely blasted with heat from the laptop. It does take some serious hardware to emulate the higher end machines on this. So uh, something you might want to keep in mind if you try it out, you might need to dial back your hardware configs because it can be pretty demanding. But that is it for now. So if you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe to be notified when I release another one. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But that's it for now, and I'll see you next time.